from KSAT 12. The Night Beat starts right now. And um, I regret using it. And um, I take accountability and responsibility for it. Tonight, an exclusive interview with San Antonio's former fire chief, Charles Hood. I sit down with Hood and discuss what led to his sudden retirement and if it was justified. We'll start tonight with a question. Do you know your police officers? And if you do, do you feel safer in your neighborhood? The city of San Antonio launching a pilot program with that very question in mind. The night team's John Paul Baraja shows us how the community immersion program works. Respond to a call and see a familiar face. How does that assist you and also the person that might be in distress or in need? It, it helps out in a big part because that person already knows you. That person can open up to you because they know you. Um, you can better serve that person because you know their needs. The community immersion program is all about police interacting with people in the neighborhood they protect. San Antonio police officer Francisco Javier was one of the first cadets to participate in the pilot program. They, they dap you up and they open up, you know. Knowing those who are sworn to serve and protect your community is something we've often heard in our Know My Neighborhood series. More visibility. Be, be more visible. The visibility of the officers in San Antonio Police Department here so that they know they are taking care of our community and that they care. It's those concerns that community engagement officer Joel Pope hopes will be addressed through the program. Cadets spend a few hours a week in areas they'll be assigned to. Everybody wants an absence of crime in their community, but they also want the presence of justice. So we're trying to build and collaborate with our community. The goal is to promote peace, understanding, and cooperation between police and the community. Cadets meet with local business owners, civic leaders, and nonprofits like Christian Assistance Ministries. Valerie Narvaez says having officers interact with the community makes it safer for everyone. It's gonna get through layers and layers of what they're gonna to have to deal with, with that individual who's already created a story in their head that this person is bad, this officer is bad, he's wearing a badge, he's here to hurt me, he's here to lock me up. The pilot program is almost halfway through its three year run. After that, several universities will study the program and the city will decide if it becomes permanent. John Paul Barajas, KSAT 12 News. So if you want the community immersion program in your own neighborhood, we walk you through how to get it. We have information on our website, ksat.com. It was a basket brawl. After days of review, the Southland Conference handing down suspensions for players involved in Monday night's brawl after the Incarnate Word and Texas A&M Commerce basketball game. It went into overtime. Four UIW players included in that suspension. Elijah Davis will sit out the next three games. Gabe Benny Till. Marcus Glover and Alex Anderson were suspended for the next two games. Four A&M Commerce players also suspended. Conference Commissioner Chris Grant says the conference has clear expectations for sportsmanship and behavior, and the brawl was a, a clear violation of both. We reached out to UIW officials for a comment tonight on those suspensions. Haven't heard back yet. The Bear County Medical Examiner is now calling the death of this instructional assistant at Brandeis High School a homicide, but keep in mind that doesn't mean that Fred Jimenez or Mr. Fred, as he was known, was murdered. However, the Northside American Federation for Teachers says that his death proves that schools all over Texas need to make changes to protect teachers. Mr. Fred died at a hospital 10 days after he was hurt in a class of students. The Northside Independent School District said that it happened while he was attempting to, quote, redirect a student. He fell on the floor, hit his head. This afternoon, the district sent another statement wherein it blamed the tragedy on state lawmakers. So in that statement was an outline of the changes that they want to see made. And you could see them there. They're outlined their de-escalation training techniques for all staff, adequate staffing and all student support positions, particularly those inside self-contained special education classrooms, access to mental health support for staff, students and families, and safety protocols tailored to the unique needs of each classroom setting. Meanwhile, San Antonio police are also investigating Mr. Fred's death, and at this point we don't know whether anybody is gonna be charged. He's accused of stabbing and killing his own brother back in 2021. Angel Gonzalez charged with the murder of Isaac Aguilar. The incident happened at a home owned by their sister. Today was day one of the trial, and according to testimony by eyewitnesses, they were celebrating Gonzalez's birthday when he made a comment about a family member. Aguilar asked him to stop. Testimony revealed the disagreement quickly escalated from there. The next thing I knew they were on the floor. I just remember Isaac standing up and 
He said, call 911 because he stabbed me. Christine Rodriguez, Aguilar's girlfriend, was pregnant at the time. She says Aguilar collapsed and later died from his injuries at the hospital. Testimony in this case expected to continue tomorrow. If found guilty, Angel Gonzalez faces up to life in prison. A Republican governor going after a Republican House rep. One of the more heated races on the ballot this year is for State House of Representatives District 121. That's in the Alamo Heights area. The Republican incumbent Steve Allison has been targeted by Governor Greg Abbott because Allison doesn't support school vouchers. Allison joined us on our KSAT Q&A segment on the news at six. Along with vouchers, we asked him about the current migrant crisis at the border and what Governor Abbott has done in recent weeks. I think we're headed in the right direction, and, and uh, uh, that's why I said I've supported the governor on his requests. I've been down to the border three times, most recently a month and a half, two months ago, and I made a point of talking to the guardsmen that are on the ground to get their imp input uh, and reaction to what we're doing or not doing. That was just a portion of our interview. You can watch the full interview on KSAT Plus. There you can also watch our K KSAT Q&A with candidate Mark LaHood, one of Allison's challengers for the State House District 121 seat. A reminder, Election Day is March 5th. You can vote early right now. All right, switching gears right now, you drive down Cherry Street on the east side and you notice, you know, the buildings, they kind of start to look the same, but Hope House Ministries wants you to pay close attention to 430 North Cherry Street. It's the Sutton family home, a special place with a lot of history. The night team's Avery Everett takes us inside and shows us what its future could hold. They were um, everything you can imagine. Sorting back through history, Percy, Everett Fly Percy, says the Sutton family the, helped to shape San Antonio. Voting rights, um, education, of course. Samuel and Lillian Sutton were activists and advocates fighting for equal rights, and their children followed suit. I'm not sure um, what gave him and the family the courage to continue to be advocates, but uh, they really did. He has begun erecting a dwelling. And Everett Fly says their family home was at the center of their legacy. I can't think of another house or place or building in San Antonio that has that much authentic legacy. This is what it looks like today. It almost welcomes you. It's a landmark that also serves as the home base for Hope House Ministries. We're here to continue the legacy that the Sutton started here. As the social service group on the east side starts to expand, members want to honor the Suttons. This family, they, they fought for the underprivileged and anyone seeking help, they, they would lend a helping hand. And when you're in here and when you're participating in helping, you kind of feel that. A planned community center for Hope House is in its early stages. And preservation is a priority. And we need to stand up for places like this and look for ways to uh, conserve, preserve, uh, and protect them. Keeping the story of the Sutton family standing, just like this house on the corner of Cherry and Dawson. So many notable figures also passed through that house, like Thurgood Marshall and Booger T. Washington. But we took a deeper dive on the work that Hope House Ministries is doing in Dignity Hill in our Know My Neighborhood series. And tomorrow night, the next installment airs, and we're taking you to the other side of San Antonio, showing you Shira Hills. We'll hope you join us tomorrow at 6. Steve, Stephania. Thank you, Avery. Still ahead, my exclusive interview with former Fire Chief Charles Hood. He takes responsibility for the inappropriate thing he said, but how does he feel about the city manager forcing him to retire because of it? It's next on the Night Beat. This whole area is uh, 50s, 60s. Our neighborhood's been changing a lot. It's quiet, oh. it's calm, it's familiar, it's easy. I like the people. We have neighbors that we literally can go get a cup of sugar. Even people that I disagree with on, on some issues. These are people who are fleeing situations. They're trying to come here and improve their lives. That's not what the neighborhood was developed for. To me, the convenience of living here is, is a huge thing to me. 
It's easy for me to get anywhere I want to get to within San Antonio from here. You know, 281, there's 410. Just, I mean, a hop, skip, and a jump. I would love to ride my bike to McAllister and get on the Salado Creek Greenway Trail, but getting across 410 is, you know, taking your life into your own hands. These houses spoke of living a very different way, a much more casual, and a, a way that was somewhat nostalgic. This community is going to continue to grow and be there for other people to enjoy and have the life that we had. The city's first African-American fire chief, the city's first chief hire that came from outside the SAFD ranks, a man who faced the loss of firefighter Scott Deem and was witness to the horrifying sight of bodies dead in the back of a tractor trailer in South San Antonio. 16 and a half years, Charles Hood was the face, the voice and the leader of the San Antonio Fire Department. All that came to an end on January 3rd. In his first, and he says only, interview since he was forced to retire, Charles Hood admits and apologizes for making an offensive and inappropriate comment. But does he think he should have been fired because of it? In this excerpt of my exclusive interview with the former chief, I ask him just that. Do you think your forced retirement was just? You know what, I, I, can't, I can't answer that. Um, I think a little more grace <laughs> could have been applied. I definitely think that um, that should have occurred. And I think a lot of people are very surprised by that. But again, the decision was not mine, but I, I do think uh, my landing could have, could have been a little bit softer for sure. Did you have any idea when you walked into Eric Walsh's office that this was gonna happen? No, I had no idea. And, and truly, if I would have thought that, I, I probably would have uh, maybe resigned or not resigned, but retired earlier, but I had no idea when I walked in. So yeah, I was pretty shell shocked. I walk away with my head held high and there's one thing that I really <coughs> want to address. And I heard it mentioned that I leave this department, uh, you know, in disgrace. It was the president of the fire union. I yeah, said in that. disgrace. And so anyone that would say that they're either a small thinker, they're a hater, but they really have no comprehension of the relationships that you've built with the fire department, uniformed, civilian, and retired, and a community. And the love that they have shown me, um, I could never leave in disgrace. I leave standing tall, chest out, and my head hung high. What's your legacy? My legacy rides with the men and women on these fire trucks every single day. My DNA is deep in this city and it will last for generations. So I'm not really concerned about uh, leaving my legacy intact. I would have liked it to have been a little bit longer and maybe not under these circumstances, but the people that know me, the people that have been around me for all those years, um, they know who I am. The former chief plans on moving back to Phoenix. He also says the San Antonio Fire Department is in good hands. He became emotional when he talked of his love for the men and women of the San Antonio Fire Department. To see the entire interview with former Chief Charles Hood, you can watch Spreester Sessions on KSAT.com and all KSAT streaming services, including our KSAT YouTube page. Steve, before, you, before we saw this clip, you mentioned that this was the first and only interview that he mm -hmm. was gonna, that he had done since, yeah. he, since he had left. It's been more than a month since all of that happened. Why did he decide to speak now? I think it, it, you know, it's been almost a month and a half right. when you think about it. He wanted to put some closure on this. Mm -hmm. And also, as he said in that interview, he had no idea that he was going to be given an ultimatum when he walked into the city manager's office. So there's a lot of people he didn't say goodbye to, a lot of people he didn't say thank you to. Mm -hmm. And so I think that was also a big part in doing this interview. And I also think after it happened, he needed some time to contemplate it, Process. to assess it. I mean, even when we did this interview, you said it's, it's strange to do the interview and not be chief. Hmm. It's strange to do the interview and be a former San Antonio fire chief. He still has a lot of affection for this department. 
And whether his punishment was just or not, it's really for the viewers to decide. So you can watch the entire interview. Yeah. We go into Scott Deem and the migrants found in that tractor trailer and what he calls the dark days of SAFD, all in that interview on KSAT.com. All right, thank you. Yeah. Now we're going to take a live look outside. Yeah, 65 degrees out there right now. All right, so I'm looking at people jogging early in the morning, and but it's going to be even better jogging weather in a bit. You know, we will have some cooler mornings on the way, which is good. for jogging. Yes, it is. Yeah, so some cooler mornings, but not tomorrow morning. We have to wait for this weak little cold front that's going to nudge away the humidity and allow our morning temperatures to fall off even more. Let's get right to our temperature trend just for the mornings. This is typically around 7 a.m. 6, 7 a.m. when we have our morning low 62 tomorrow but in the 40s to near 50 Friday through the weekend. So cooler mornings, a little closer to average at that point and wonderful afternoons. Now, there's nothing nothing about a cold front on the map today. It's still developing off to the west of us. You look at the high in Midlands 86, Lubbock 85, 86 Del Rio for the high, 78 in San Antonio. It's going to be a little bit warmer as we get into tomorrow afternoon. Tomorrow morning though, 62 here in town, into the 50s farther to the west around San Antonio near 60 degrees. And we will have some fog to contend with because of that bit of mugginess that we still have in the air. Anticipate patchy fog for the morning commute tomorrow, some reduced visibilities. I don't anticipate it to be too problematic. It's just gonna be out there, something you'll notice and have to take into account. And by 9 a.m., it's burned off and we've got nothing but sunshine. Notice by noon, we're up to 80 degrees and then 85 for the high temperature tomorrow. And the humidity is actually going to drop in the second part of the day. Mid 80s, Pleasanton 86, Hondo 86 tomorrow afternoon, 85 New Braunfels, a little bit cooler in parts of the hill country. I mean, Comfort 81 for the high in Kerrville, about 79. Despite the, the cold front that's moving through tomorrow afternoon, temperatures will still be comfortable. I mean, Friday through the weekend, I told you the mornings, cool in the 40s to near 50. Afternoons in the 70s with low humidity and sunshine. Good timing for the upcoming weekend. But here's what we're dealing with now. Air temperature of 65, dew point is 60. Those two numbers are going to meet in the lower 60s and give us saturated air in the areas of fog. But as that cold front starts to approach us tomorrow, through the noon hour, we'll have a bit of humidity in the air. And then shortly after noon, that humidity is going to be pushed eastward out of San Antonio and then completely moved out of all of South Texas by tomorrow night into Friday morning. So that drier air is going to allow those temperatures to fall off even more for the mornings, Friday through the weekend, and give us those beautiful, sunny, comfortable, low humidity afternoons. And then notice next week, we do see those mornings warm up again, but I am anticipating another cold front to arrive about this time next week, and one that's probably even a bit stronger. The countdown is on 47 days until the total solar eclipse. Eagle Pass will be the first city in the U.S. to experience totality. Oh, awesome. Thank you. All right. I don't want to sugarcoat this. The record is ugly. It is. Larry, the last few games here, the last stretch, they got to do better than 10 or 11 games. So, yeah, they're what? Last place in the Western yeah. Conference, but I think they're about four games behind the next team, which I believe is Portland. So if the Spurs can get hot, they could definitely move up out of the basement. They have 27 games to go. So how are they approaching that? And Jamie Reedy already setting records, records at Trinity, and she's a freshman coming up. I ain't know like a, a brand can make clothes this size, but to see, you know, the stuff he be wearing, his Louis, that's crazy. That, that's amazing, man. And he got some unique pieces, like they're, they're fire. Wimby is the newest house ambassador for Louis Vuitton and Kelvin loves it in big board sports. The NBA All-Star break is over with for the Spurs. Wimby and his teammates held practice today before flying to Sacramento, California to resume the rodeo road trip tomorrow night. Mary Rominger was there and she has more. Well, Larry, outside of the All-Star participants, the All-Star break was much needed time away from basketball for the young Spurs. Keldon Johnson saying he missed his guys, but he was due for family time. We also asked the team at this afternoon's practice how they're planning to approach the back end of the season. 
I mean, we got a lot of things that go on in life, whether, you know, it's on the court or off the court, and uh, just to get a refresher is huge. Uh, I know I definitely appreciate the break and, and, and being able to, you know, be around, be around my, my family and, and, and laugh and joke and, and have fun and not have to think about basketball or, or the next game and things like that. So, um, you know, the break was much needed and, and I definitely, definitely appreciated it. I mean, more wins, I can say that. That's, that's, <laughs> that's obvious, but um, I just feel like us playing together, um, us really coming together as a team and seeing, you know, everything that we've worked on you know, coming to full circle. I feel like us being better on the offensive end, whether it's finding, finding teammates and playing with each other, uh, playing for each other, or on the defensive end, just getting more stops. Um, you know, Vic's been doing a tremendous job uh, blocking shots, but on the perimeter, we got to hold people to get in, you know, from their spots and, you know, just really just picking it up on the defensive end. The upcoming stretch of games to close out the rodeo road trip will be tough for the Spurs. You have Kings, Lakers, Jazz, Timberwolves, but that's nothing new playing in the Western Conference. From the Spurs practice facility, Mary Rominger, KSAT 12 Sports. Larry, back to you. Thank you, Mary. The Kings will host the Spurs tomorrow night at 9. So the focus has shifted to the postseason for the Trinity women's basketball program after wrapping up a 20 and 5 regular season on Sunday with a 33 point win against Centenary. In that game, Bernie High School alum Jamie Reedy topped the program's all-time record for three-pointers in a game with eight. She went eight of ten beyond the arc. Now, you normally don't see that kind of shooting in a game, especially from a freshman, although her teammates say it was just another day for the three-point ace. I was not shocked at all. I was just like, this is a normal day. I see her make 11 shots in practice every day. Like, it's just like swish, 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 swish. And so I was like, I didn't even realize she broke it. I was just like, it's another Jamie. Like, it's another shooting clinic out there for her. That game, it was like, get the ball to Jamie. Like, well, anything that she throws up is going to go in. Like, she, it was just, and it was really great to watch. I mean, just see a freshman be able to do such things. It really kind of paves the way for her career here at Trinity. Jamie's one of the finest high school players that I've ever watched play and I watched her a lot in high school and I've been, I've been a huge fan of hers. She's getting credit for breaking a record but what she did was help our team win. She played her role very well that day for what we needed from her and there's other times where she's made the same plays but she's passed it to a different person and they made the shot. Now, unfortunately, Reedy was taking a test today when we visited practice. Now we hope she aced it. A painful bull ride that had fans concerned after the break. Texas Rangers first baseman Nathaniel Lowell is coming off a solid season in which he hit 262 with 17 homers and 82 runs batted in. He also won a Gold Glove Award last season. So what's the big thing he's looking to get better at this season? I want to be a complete player, uh, not just a, not just a offensive player or a defensive player. It's time to get better on both sides of the ball. Third baseman and San Antonio guy Josh Young suffered a low grade strain calf while fielding grounders on Friday. He's expected to miss approximately three weeks. Let's rodeo San Antonio bull riding from tonight. First up, we have Coy Polmeyer on board. Surprise, and this ride did not end well. The bull spins right, and eventually his head smacks the head of Polmeyer, sending that cowboy off and flying. And after landing, Ooh. he laid motionless on the ground. The rodeo feed cut away from the action while he was attended to. Look again in slow motion. Now, after 60 Ooh. seconds or so, the announcer said he's moving his hands. We wish that cowboy the very best. Ride of the night it was turned in right here by Jordan Hansen. He took the bull justified all eight seconds for a score of 84. He's your winner, and that's one of the best rides of the rodeo so far. That ride was justified. It the was. score was justified. Yes. A lot of justification in there. Indeed. And this we'll is keep why you, it makes me nervous. I know. We'll keep you posted. I searched for his name online, didn't find a whole lot about him, but they said he was moving his hands. So fingers crossed, yeah. that's good. That's, and it's so why good. they wear the helmets. Yep. Yeah. Exactly. Thanks, Thank Larry. You. We'll be right back.